All right, what's up, YouTubers? Welcome back to Structure Free Learning. In this video, we're going to hit up some designing of singly reinforced concrete beams and do an example problem here where I've got this simply supported beam with uniform dead and live loads given. I got the concrete and steel properties that I need to use here, the strengths at least of the materials. And what I want to do is design a singly reinforced concrete beam, which means I want to select and place the steel depth of the beam. I want to be able to define that and the width of the beam so that I have a design moment strength that's greater than or equal to the ultimate moment that's applied here. And just for some reference, uh, I put the reinforcement ratio relationship to the strain profile. All right, so the first thing we want to do is estimate the beam weight and calculate what this required moment strength is going to be, this MU. And estimating the beam weight is more of an art. And so if you don't have the experience or just you've never done it before, you might as well just guess a number. And that's the best way to do it. For this problem, we're just going to guess that this beam is going to weigh 500 pounds per foot. Now with the beam weight, we're ready to go ahead and calculate um, the required calculate the required strength this mu here and normally you know you would do a shear moment diagram with a structural analysis or something but because we have a simply supported beam uh, I'm gonna assume that you know that the shear mo shear diagram is linear and the moment diagram is parabolic and the maximum moment occurs right at mid span here you know it's gonna be pretty simple the dead the dead load the distributed dead load now is if I get my pen working here the distributed dead load WD is one kit per foot that was given to us or specified one kit per foot plus the beam weight of 500 pounds per foot or 0.5 kit per foot so that would make a dead load moment MD of you know WDL squared over 8 which in this case is 1.5 kit per foot times the length which is 28 foot squared divided by 8 and when you work out some algebra here this comes out to 147 kit feet and then the live load moment ML is going to be WL times L squared over 8 which is in this case I think the live load was 2 kit per foot so 2 kit per foot which is gonna be uh, 196 kit feet alright and so we have our dead load moment effect if you will and our live load moment effect and now we got to use some combos some load combinations to find our ultimate load effect and so here this MU and in general you know you, you, what you really have to do with when you do these load combinations is look at every single possible load combination and so if you look in your ACI code you might see a bunch of load combinations and so one of them is like 1.4 dead 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live some others that involve wind and earthquake rain snow blah 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 in this case there's only dead and live so these are the only two load combinations to consider and because the live load is larger than the dead load I can probably I can reason Reasonably deduce that this is going to be the lo governing load combination. So the ultimate moment effect, this MU, is 1.2 times the dead load moment plus 1.6 times the live load moment. And this ultimate moment effect is 490 kip feet. The next thing we want to do is establish a target reinforcement ratio. And sometimes it's given to you in a problem statement. Sometimes you've got to pick it yourself. So in this case here, we're going to pick it ourselves. And we're going to say we're going to try to target a beam that has a strain value at ultimate of uh, epsilon t of or epsilon s. The strain in the steel at ultimate is 0 0.009. So we've got a pretty ductile beam. And so if I just substitute this into my reinforcement ratio relationship, I will get that this row that we're targeting is 0.85 times 4 over 60, and I'm, I'm just going to forego the units because I know the units cancel out, times 0.85 times 0 0.003, which is going to be the strain at ultimate, over 0 0.003 plus 0 0.009. And when I compute this here, it tells me that my target reinforcement ratio is 0 0.012, or about 1.2%. Now we're ready to use the basic design relationship to try to figure out what our width and our depth to steel for this cross section is going to be and so here you know I've thrown out the the basic design relationship here and if you look at another video or some other textbooks that that show you the derivation for this here uh, there's a, a 
a way to manipulate this design relationship so that you have your reinforcement ratio be a part of it and that really involves you know taking this and com including this TS or this ASFY you know substituting the definition for the moment the nominal moment D minus A over 2 greater than or equal to MU and then using equilibrium this uh, um, this A ASFY over 0.85 FC prime times B and substituting that into here and all also, including into this the definition of the reinforcement ratio, which is AS over BD, and what you'll get is, is this big old equation right here that looks like this. And this is the basic design relationship with the left side of it, uh, at least the, this term over here, all grouped in terms of the reinforcement ratios, the yield strength, rho, FY, FC prime, just things that we have already established as as, with this BD squared over here and we can isolate this BD squared so that we could have a requirement for our design choices for B and D so this BD squared would be greater than or equal to MU over all this and now if I just substitute the numbers that I know for everything here on the right hand side I can just go ahead and substitute and that's gonna be and if I go ahead and I plug and chug I get a requirement for BD squared that this BD squared has to be greater than or equal to 10,152 point 24 inches cubed and what this means is that in order for me to satisfy the basic design relationship whatever combination of B and D that I choose it has to be this BD squared has to be greater than or equal to this right here and this is essentially another form of my basic design relationship but in terms of B and D or in terms or in a way so that I can help choose B and D all right, so now we're ready to choose some BD values and so here with our requirement for BD squared we could say that here well this is like step five and literally unless given some other information it's really kind of like if I choose this as B what do I need for D that's really the an the question and answer that you have to ask yourself and so the best thing to do is really just make a table so here I got B D bam and let's see I'm gonna start at let's say like 12 inches that seems like a good number 14 inches and 16 inches and let's see what that means if I and if I use my calculator and I substitute B of 12 inches into here I can solve for D that D is going to be 29.08 inches let me show you real fast one time just in case so I would just plug in for B equals 14 inches I would just do 14 inches times d squared is greater than or equal to 10,152.24 inches cubed and then I would solve for d and that would tell me that uh, d would have to be greater than or equal to 26.9 inches if I repeat the same process with 16 inches I get 25.2 inches and that's these are my b's if I choose these b's these are my d's that I need to have to satisfy the basic design relationship one of the better ways to choose this is also to look at the d over b ratio that this results in if I look at this a little bit closer, my D over B for this first row would be 2.42. For my uh, that second one, it'll be 1.93. And for the last one, it's going to be 1.58. For an economical design, you want to try to get a D over B ratio that's somewhere, you know, approximately, somewhere between 1.5 to 2. You know, it just depends on what your situation is and what's how much space you have and that, that help you determine what that's going to be. I mean, sometimes, it's given a, depending on the problem, they tell you what the D over B ratio should be. That way everyone gets the same answer. But in this case here, you know, I think this D over B of round, round 2 seems pretty good to me. And I'm going to say I'm going to use a B equal to 14 inches for my design and I'm gonna choose a D of 27 inches so I know I'm gonna satisfy that BD squared and also choosing a D of 27 inches is kind of helpful because a lot of times H the total height of your beam is approximately D plus 2.5 to 3.5 inches if you add about three inches to the depth of your beam that's pretty good to cover the distance from the center of the bar to the stirrup thickness of the stirrup and the minimum cover requirement that you need and I don't know if you can visualize that from what I said but what I meant was here this H this additional distance of two and a half to three and a half inches if this is my flexural reinforcement and usually I'll have a shear stirrup that comes right here like this that additional three 
three inches or two and a half to three and a half inches is enough to cover that distance right here this plus the thickness of the bar which is right there plus that clear cover requirement which is typically 1.5 inches for an indoor building stirrup and half the diameter of the bar and in this case you know I'm gonna say that H is gonna be 27 plus 3 inches here I'll have a 30 inch deep beam here and my cross section will be BH will be 14 by 30 specify that formwork and say hey I need a 30 inch deep beam yo and a 14 inch wide beam what up alright so now we're finally ready to select the the tensile steel and in order for us to select the tensile steel we need to figure out what the area of steel that we need is here I'll say AS required and we're just gonna use the reinforcement ratio this row target that we had times our B times the D that we selected that's gonna be 0 0.012 times 14 inches times 27 inches that's just gonna tell me that I need 4.536 inches squared of steel and here I gotta select bars it's some combination of bar size and number to meet this requirement and the best way to do this again is to make a little table and here's what I like to do I like to have let's see a column for the number bar so for instance in this problem we're gonna let's consider the number 9 10 and 11 size bars you know you could do all if you have a spreadsheet do them all right and then here the, I, I like to also update or just for myself I like to put the area of each uh, bar size here so this is going to be 1 inch squared this is 1.27 inches squared and this is 1.56 inches squared and then I can calculate the number of bars that's required and the number that I would select Let's say for the nine, number 9 bar, determine the number required of number 9 bar. I'm just going to take the AS required divided by the area of a number 9 bar. And that would just be, in this case, 4.536 inches squared divided by 1 inch squared. This, this is trivial. And I'm writing it down. Shame on me right here. Shame on you if you don't get it. So here, 4.536 bars right there. And here, if I just go through the other ones for number 10, I'm going to need 3.57 bar. And for the number 11, I'll need 2.90 bars. Now, obviously, it's you can't choose, to, you can't specify 4.5 number 9 bars or 4.536. You've got to round up here. So I would have to choose 5 number 9 bars four number 10 bars or three number 11 bars and usually more distance you have to go when you round up that's the more conservatism that gets it put into your your design or it's like choosing more or having less economical maybe you know because you're choosing more still than you really need so maybe the most economical choice in this case is to choose three number 11 bars but four number 10 bars would work and five number nine bars would work and let's see for me here I just I'm gonna go ahead and choose four number 10 bars I'm gonna say try four number 10 bars and that means my AS design is four times 1.27 inches squared which will be 5.08 inches squared now we're pretty much done with our design here because we've selected a B we selected a D we have the height of the beam here we've established that we've selected four number 10 bars so we have a cross section and, and so what's left is to do some basic checks and make sure that we have a tension control beam and check our beam weight so that we're within our assumption the first thing to do when you do these basic checks is to establish what this row design is yeah that's just simply a s design divided by B times D whatever you select it so this is 5.08 inches squared squared divided by 14 inches times 27 inches and this is going to be 0 0.013 so still very close to 0 0.012 but just a little bit more and now what we want to do is make sure that we have the minimum amount of steel according to the ACI code and you can establish a row min using ACI 10.5.1 and this will tell you that for this beam uh, for the properties given and everything here this point this row min is 0 0.0033 and our row design far exceeds that so we are good this I'll put a green check mark good yes now we want to make sure that we still have a tension control beam and we can compare that with a row max 
So rho max for a tension controlled beam is, I'm going to say that's rho of 0 0.005, or the reinforcement ratio associated with a tensile strain value of 0 0.005 at ultimate. This reinforcement ratio of our design should be less than or equal to 0 0.0181 in order for us to maintain a tension controlled beam. And yes, that is also true, so check. Good. And the next thing that we want to do is verify that the beam weight is less than our assumed beam weight. So is, uh, let's do this in red, why not? Is the actual beam weight, W beam design, is this less than our assumed, W beam assumed? And if you recall from the beginning, we had assumed 500 pounds per foot. And to estimate the beam weight, we just have to use the density of concrete times the cross-sectional area of the beam section, which in this case, I'll just assume a normal weight concrete, so 150 pounds per cubic foot times the concrete area, which is BH, 14 inches times 30 inches, because I want to convert my inches into feet squared, so it's going to be 144 inches squared per foot squared. And again, is this less than 500 pounds per foot? That is still in question. And so if I plug and check some numbers, I'll get that this whole term, 437 five pounds per foot and that is less than 500 pounds per foot and that because our sum our actual beam weight is less than our assumed beam weight our anal check we are okay we don't need to go back and update mu and and verify that our design is good one thing I like to do in general if I have the time is to also get what phi mn is to calculate what the design moment strength is and if you if you want to you can go ahead and do that and that's that if you do that and you do it correctly you should probably get something like 544.07 kip feet for the design that we have for the but you know as long as your b your d and your area of steel meets that requirement this this uh this bd squared requirement and your row is at least 0.012 or better then you're good you're going to satisfy the basic design relationship all right so hopefully that was helpful and insightful uh, i will leave it to you to draw a section a cross section detail for this uh, for this design let me know if you have any questions see ya